Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Masters of Horror Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled Pelts, begins with the police investigating a crime scene filled with dead bodies of people who suffered horrific deaths. The crime scene photographer takes pictures of everything, and with each bright flash more details about the deaths are revealed in their terrifying glory. Jake, a fur trader, is not having a good day. His company is not doing well, and the recent batch of processed furs were substandard. He yells at his employees for not doing better. He's now under high pressure to keep the business afloat and find higher quality pelts, and he leaves the office in a blind rage. To blow off steam, he goes to his favorite strip club in town. He's a regular there, but tonight he only has eyes for one particular stripper. Jake pays for a private lap dance, and the bouncer ushers him inside a hallway. He enters a dark room with just a red chair inside, and no sign of his favorite stripper yet. Through the darkness, the enchanting stripper named Shanna makes her way to him while hurling insults. He likes it when she mocks him and is mean to him. While she gyrates, Jake promises her that his fur business will take off soon, and he will be a rich man. He obviously desires her, but he can't touch her or any of the other strippers or get anything more than a lap dance. Shanna shimmies closer to him. Jake can't control himself and suddenly presses her up against the wall to take her without her consent. Shanna fights him off with several jabs. She manages to free herself from his muscles and puts the chair between them as protection. Undeterred, Jake vows that she will sleep with him soon. He then leaves the scared Shanna alone in the room. That same night, a trapper and his son venture into a piece of private land deep within the woods. The land is owned by a scary old woman, and for generations, horrifying stories about monsters and other creatures haunt the property. All the other locals living nearby avoid the property as much as they can, because the stories say that inside the old woman's property are the ruins of an ancient city. But the trapper is desperate to capture animals he can sell. Yesterday, he snuck into the property and laid some traps. Tonight, he and his son snuck back again to see if they caught anything. It turns out their traps have captured a bunch of raccoons. The trapper now schools his innocent son on how to kill the captured raccoons. If any of the animals escape, they can use the baseball bat to whack them in the head. While the trapper proceeds to skin the animals, his son notices the murals of raccoons on the worn walls of the ruins. They also discover that one of the raccoons had escaped the trap by chewing its own leg off. Gathering all the dead raccoons, they sneak out of the private property to avoid being seen by the old woman who lives in a cottage there. That night, the trapper celebrates their success by popping open a beer bottle. He remarks on how unblemished and beautiful the raccoon pelts are, excited at the prospect of selling them at a high price. However, the son confesses that he has a weird feeling about what they did. The trapper chalks it up to nerves and leaves his son to process the pelts while he goes upstairs to sleep. On the other side, Jake goes back to the strip club so he can watch Shanna he harassed before. She is now dancing on stage and undressing her white fur coat and bikini. While intently staring at Shanna, he receives a call from the trapper who has been supplying him with low-quality pelts in the past. But the trapper insists that the pelts he has now are so beautiful and Jake will have everything he wants. Obviously, Jake's thoughts go to Shanna, and he begins to believe that if he gets rich from the pelts, he will be able to sway Shanna to sleep with him. Left downstairs, the trapper's son gets mesmerized by the silken texture of the pelts he's hanging to dry. A strange urge overtakes him. He grabs the baseball bat and goes up to his father's room. He wakes up the trapper who's lying in bed. Just like his father had instructed him, the son whacks him in the head with the bat. His head immediately gets crushed like a mashed potato and blood sprays the bedroom walls. The next morning, Jake and his male assistant arrive at the trapper's house to check the raccoon pelts he promised. They check downstairs first and are greeted by the sight of the majestic pelts drying. But they also discover the dead body of the trapper upstairs, still lying on the bed with flies swarming the carcass. It turns out, after his son bludgeoned him to death with the baseball bat last night, he went downstairs to look at the mesmerizing pelts one last time. Then he dived face first into one of the steel traps they used on the raccoons and terminated his own life. Jake and his assistant are appalled by the horrifying corpses they saw inside. The two race outside to quell their nausea. Then Jake starts thinking. The pelts inside the house are so beautiful that he is sure they will become the talk of the town when they debut it at the upcoming international fur trade show. 
This is the way for his company to have a big break. So Jake convinces his assistant that they should just get the pelts, and then they will just contact the police anonymously to report the deaths of the trapper and his son. They spring into action and grab the pelts. The two get into the car and hightail it out of there. They bring the pelts to their office and show them to the female employees, who also get a weird feeling upon seeing the pelts. The next thing Jake needs is a model to show off the fabulous coat they'll be making from the pelts. So he goes to Shanna at the club, who reiterates that she will never sleep with him. But he convinces her that this gig is just a business transaction and a chance for her to be a model. Since Shanna had failed dreams of becoming a model, she gets tempted to accept. He then informs her that the coat will be done by next week, and he'll bring it to her place. Sultrally, she tells Jake that she knows what he likes, and she's still undecided on whether or not she'll accept his offer. Jake's employees get to work on making the pelts into the fabulous coat that he promised Shauna. He gets mad at the trimmer for messing up the cutting of the fur. Reprimanding the trimmer, Jake threatens him that he will crush his dragon balls if he makes a mistake again. That night, the trimmer gets the same urge as the trapper's son did. With a glazed look in his eyes, he pulls out the silver scissors he uses when working. He then cuts his chest wide open with the scissors, and his bowels spill out of his body. The next day, Jake's assistant brings up the idea of finding a steady supply of the same beautiful raccoon pelts. Having that supply would take their business to the next level, and Jake rushes to the trapper's house to look for clues on where he got the raccoons. He arrives at the house and rifles through the trapper's drawers and things. After a few minutes, Jake finds a map to the old woman's land tacked on the wall. That same night, Jake heads to the forest indicated on the map. He ventures inside the fence barricading the land from the rest of the forest and sees the same ancient ruins where the trapper and his son found the raccoons. He discovers the old woman's cottage and introduces himself to her. The old woman mysteriously says that she has been expecting him, so she lets him in. Inside the cottage, Jake asks her about the raccoons. She tells him a story about the lost city nearby. The family of raccoons have been the guardians of the ruins for centuries, and she has been warning the locals to stay off the land because the raccoons have otherworldly powers. Now that the trapper has killed the raccoons, a curse is being meted out to him and anyone who uses the raccoons for profit. Consequently, all the cursed people are dying from the same gruesome methods that trappers and furriers use to get the pelts from animals. Jake laughs at her story and dismisses it as a mere myth. He then offers her money in exchange for him getting a couple of raccoons for breeding, so he can have access to a steady supply of beautiful pelts. But the old woman flies into a rage and shouts at him for disrespecting the raccoons. She chases him out of the cottage, speaking in a foreign language. Out of his earshot, the old woman whispers that the curse is not done with Jake, and the worst is yet to come. Jake drives back to the city and heads to the office. There, he finds the dead body of his Asian seamstress on the floor. His assistant recounts the story, saying that the seamstress stayed up late last night to finish the coat. Then, inexplicably, she started to sew her nose and mouth shut, causing her to suffocate to death. But this doesn't matter to Jake at all. What's important is that the coat is finally finished, and it's even more beautiful than he imagined it would be. He gleefully grabs it and takes it to Shanna's apartment. She is reluctant to open the door to him, but once she sees the fur coat through the peephole, she is entranced by it. She opens the door and Jake comes in. She couldn't resist running her hands all over the splendid coat and trying it on. She even tells Jake that she doesn't care about modeling it at the fur trade show. She only wants to have the coat. Jake sees his opening and insinuates that if she proves to him that she is worth it, he won't consider other models for the gig, and she can have the coat too. Shauna understands the transaction he is offering, so she gets on her bed to seduce Jake. The two perform some hormone yoga while she is wearing the fur coat. Afterward, Jake goes to her bathroom to freshen up. Inside, he gets possessed by the curse, and he grabs a knife from her sink. He then proceeds to cut his skin off and make a vest out of it. Jake screams in pain as he gingerly peels off the human skin vest. Back in her bedroom, Shanna is too consumed by the fur coat to hear what Jake is doing. She giggles and says that sleeping with a detestable man like Jake is extremely worth it if it means she gets the fur coat. Dazed and in pain, Jake stumbles out of her bathroom and holds up the human skin vest. He proudly tells Shanna that this is his masterpiece and he did it for her. Understandably, she is horrified by what she saw and runs screaming out of her apartment. Jake chases after her, still possessed by the curse. Shanna gets into the elevator as it's going down. Jake lifts the door up, jumping through the shaft and into the elevator. She tries to escape, but Jake grabs her greasy leg. 
She tries to crawl away from him by holding on to the closing elevator doors, but her hand gets crushed and cut off. Blood sprays all over her. Later, the assistant arrives at the apartment building and sees the police investigating the same bloody crime scene shown earlier in the film. Jake is dead on the elevator floor, with his human skin vest lying beside him. Shanna succumbed to her injuries and is also dead, with her cut-off hands strewn outside the elevator. The movie ends with the assistant taking it all in shock and muttering that the dead man is his friend. The second story, titled The Damned Thing, begins with a young boy named Kevin and his mother preparing for a surprise birthday to his father. As they prepare the cake, a drop of black grease falls onto Kevin's hand. Looking up, they see that the ceiling has been stained by the grease. The two don't think much of it, but when their father enters the room, he seems extremely uneasy. Panicking, he claims that the spirits of hell have found him. Then, suddenly, he pulls out a gun and shoots the mother. Realizing his father has gone mad, Kevin takes advantage of the distraction and flees. His father quickly gives chase, but luckily the cover of night and the sound of thunder help Kevin avoid detection. Kevin stealthily climbs a tree. Just when he thinks he's safe, his father spots his reflection in a car window. As Kevin despairs, a sudden force appears and pins his father to the car. The force quickly tears him in half. Witnessing the whole ordeal, Kevin is stunned and confused about what just happened. Twenty years later, Kevin becomes a sheriff and has his own family. His birthday is approaching, but he has no desire to celebrate. He declines his partner's kind offer, and his partner wonders why Kevin never sold his old family house. That way, he wouldn't be reminded of his painful childhood memories. Kevin tells his partner that the house is the only thing his family left him, and he can't bear to part with it. His father's death had a profound impact on him, so much so that he installed security cameras both inside and outside the house. His wife couldn't stand the feeling of being watched and moved into a trailer with their son. On the other side of town, a young man is repairing a wooden ladder when he accidentally hits his hand. Angry, he starts hitting the nails with all his might. Suddenly, a force takes control of him, causing him to hammer himself to death. The reason Kevin installed security cameras was to prevent the tragic events of his childhood from happening again. He sought to uncover the truth behind his father's death. Just as Kevin was lost in thought, the phone suddenly rang. However, there was only static on the line. Soon after, the surveillance footage started glitching, and he could no longer monitor the house. So Kevin went outside to investigate and spotted a car driving away. He got in his vehicle and pursued it. After a while, he found a woman who had been in a car accident. She kept whispering that the road was alive. Not understanding what she meant, Kevin decided to help her first. To his horror, when he tried to help her up, she was torn in half. At the hospital, a female doctor told Kevin about a young man who had killed himself with a hammer and another doctor who had inexplicably slit his own throat. To prevent public panic, the doctor didn't reveal these incidents and urged Kevin to uncover the truth as soon as possible. As the mysterious force awakened once more, Kevin began to experience hallucinations more frequently. A psychiatrist told him that his hallucinations were due to the unresolved psychological trauma from his childhood, but Kevin thought he had his mental state under control. When Kevin was about to buy new surveillance equipment, the newspaper boss told Kevin that similar events had occurred in the town before, with people going mad and corpses appearing everywhere. It was said that the cause of these incidents was a construction accident in the 1950s, which took place at Kevin's childhood home. Perhaps Kevin's family's tragedy was also rooted in this incident. To find the truth, Kevin opened a box that his father had left behind. To his surprise, the box was empty. However, he then discovered a hidden compartment containing several newspapers. The articles detailed the process of the once thriving town becoming a ghost town. The events took place in the 1950s when Kevin's grandfather was an oil driller. As before, the drilling team arrived in the town and began drilling into the ground. Little did they know, beneath the earth lay dormant spirits of hell. Once awakened, the spirits unleashed a poisonous wind upon the town. Those touched by the wind would lose their sanity and become killing machines. The members of the drilling team were hunted relentlessly. The vengeful spirits even went after their families and descendants, who couldn't escape their grasp even by moving away. Now, based on the timeline, the vengeful spirits from hell would surely return. After learning this, Kevin called his wife, urging her to take their child and leave town as soon as possible. His wife didn't understand why Kevin was so stubborn and refused to live with his family. As they argued, the vengeful spirits entered his wife's trailer. She became irritable and started accusing Kevin, claiming that everything that had happened was just his imagination. As their argument escalated, she suddenly couldn't help but attack their son. 
Fortunately, Kevin arrived in time to snap her out of it. Meanwhile, the residents of the town began to go mad, engaging in all sorts of chaos and violence. Kevin's partner couldn't handle the situation and had to call Kevin for help. After that, the partner ran to the church to confess, admitting his inability to maintain the town's safety. He also confessed that he tried to win his girlfriend back by drawing a cartoon mouse, but she called him childish. But he didn't understand what he did wrong. The priest, upon hearing his annoying story, pulled out a gun and shot the partner dead, calling him an idiot. After sending his wife and child home, Kevin found many townspeople gathered at his house. Since Kevin had once sworn to protect the townspeople, those who were still somewhat lucid came to his home. Kevin maintained order and settled them in the basement. Shortly after, Kevin also settled his wife and son. It wasn't long before the townspeople in the basement were affected by the vengeful spirits, and their existing grudges led to fighting. Kevin was also influenced by the spirits, laughing as he watched the chaos unfold. He even killed the only sane survivor. Soon, Kevin began to harbor murderous intent towards his wife. However, someone knocked on the door and he opened it first. The townspeople knew that the spirits were after Kevin, so even when asking for help, they were quite rude. As a result, Kevin killed another person. After the murder, Kevin once again targeted his wife and son. His wife quickly took their son and escaped through the window. The priest believed that Kevin was the root of the disaster, so he rushed to the scene, planning to atone for the town's sins with the lives of Kevin's wife and son. Fortunately, Kevin had returned to normal by this time, but his wife and son were unaware. The vengeful spirits were finally about to reveal themselves, using an oil slick to limit Kevin's movements. Facing such a massive creature, Kevin knew he was doomed. Soon, he became a meal for the spirits. His wife, seeing this, abandoned her rescue plan. As they prepared to flee, their car broke down, leading to their demise. The third story, titled Family, begins in a quiet American Midwestern town where everything seems quite peaceful. However, the scene suddenly shifted to an oily man named Harold, who was working in the basement. He poured a large amount of corrosive liquid into a barrel and then poured it all over his deceased father's body, turning him into a skeleton. After leaving the house, Harold discovered new neighbors had moved in next door. After exchanging some greetings with them rather than hormones, Harold went inside to make lunch for his wife. Although he and his wife's conversation could be heard, a close-up shot revealed that his wife and daughter had long been dead. Harold had turned their bodies into skeletons and displayed them in the room to keep him company. Harold's new neighbors were a married couple named David and Celia. They moved to the town to escape the grief of losing their daughter and start anew. One night, while driving tired, David accidentally knocked over the mailbox outside Harold's house. When they found out that Harold wasn't home, David and Celia left a note to apologize. What they didn't realize was that Harold had been watching them all along. Among the ruins of the mailbox lay a skeleton, which appeared to be another one of Harold's masterpieces. The next morning, the mailbox had mysteriously been restored. Despite the mailbox's restoration, David and Celia felt the need to apologize. Naturally, they also thought compensation was in order. After hearing their intentions, Harold invited them into his home as guests. Following some small talk, they got to know each other a little better. Suddenly, Harold began to have hallucinations, where Celia appeared unsatisfied and told him she often felt unfulfilled. Harold soon snapped out of it, only for the hallucinations to reoccur. In these visions, Celia continuously seduced Harold, wanting to spend a passionate night with him. When it was time to leave, Harold refused the couple's offer of compensation. Seeing what a nice person he was, Celia suggested they treat him to dinner instead. Harold agreed without hesitation, thinking his luck had finally turned. He worked extra hard on crafting his father's skeleton and finished it quickly. In his fantasy world, his family was always alive and by his side. Harold wanted to include Celia in his family, but his wife refused. Later, Harold considered that David might have discovered the skeleton. However, his wife countered the idea, saying that if David had found the skeleton, he would have called the police by now and wouldn't have come to chat. Previously, while talking with his fantasy family, his daughter mentioned she wanted her grandma to move in. So Harold started looking for prey on the streets. He quickly found a target and approached an elderly woman. This revealed that the skeletons in Harold's house were likely his previous victims, with no blood relation to him. Harold killed anyone he liked, turned them into skeletons, and gained new family members. This means he had become so lonely that he resorted to murder to fill his fantasy world. Friday evening soon arrived, and Harold went to David's house as promised. 
David and Celia also had a basement, but they never went down there because the lights didn't work and it smelled strange. Dinner went smoothly, and Harold enjoyed talking with them. David and Celia had planned to have another child, but David wasn't ready, which upset Celia. Upon learning of the couple's discord, Harold began to have sinister thoughts and secretly monitored them. His wife knew what he was thinking and expressed her dissatisfaction. Things had reached this point, and Harold didn't want to hide his greasy colors anymore. The skeleton in the oil tank was his previous wife. As soon as someone upset Harold, he would look for new prey to replace his former family members. If it hadn't been for his daughter passing by, Harold might have harmed his wife. His daughter mentioned she wanted an older sister, and Harold quickly agreed to her request. After waiting for a while outside the university, Harold experienced another hallucination. A female student approached him and said she wanted to be his goddaughter. Harold was speechless, as he was looking for a proper family, not a lover. He scouted a few potential targets before finally finding a satisfactory candidate. In his hallucinated world, the target kept begging Harold to make a move on her, which emboldened him. However, due to a lack of focus, Harold got into a car accident, and this time the target narrowly escaped. Injured Harold ended up at the same hospital where David was. Since they were neighbors, David offered help to Harold. When Harold casually inquired about David and Celia's recent life, David didn't hold back. Harold believed that David was not good enough for Celia, and his mother agreed with his opinion. One day, David suddenly went missing. Harold seized the opportunity to comfort Celia. After this incident, Harold harbored murderous intentions towards his own wife. Of course, his wife had been dead for a long time. She believed that David's disappearance was connected to Harold, but Harold denied it. Soon, Harold smashed his wife into pieces. Six days later, Harold paid another visit to Celia. Upon learning that Celia was having sleepless nights due to grief, Harold invited her to his house for dinner. Celia hesitated for a while, but eventually agreed. During dinner, Harold couldn't keep his eyes off Celia's body, activating a scanning mode. As he couldn't distinguish between reality and hallucination, Harold was puzzled why Celia became so cold to him while he believed she was always seducing him. Soon, the hallucination appeared again, and Celia started to tease Harold. But in reality, Celia didn't understand why Harold suddenly became so strange, even proposing to be her boyfriend. However, she had no interest in this fat old man. Under Harold's repeated persuasion, Celia reluctantly stayed. But soon, her craving for a cigarette kicked in. Harold didn't want to stop her repeatedly, so he invited her to smoke in the yard. After dinner, Celia asked to see Harold's room. This time, Harold decided to be honest and introduced her to his family. He intended to kill Celia, but she had impressive skills and quickly shook him off. However, Harold had already locked the door in preparation. Just as he thought he had her, a hand suddenly reached out from behind. Harold was knocked unconscious. It was David who had arrived just in time. It turns out David's disappearance indeed had nothing to do with Harold. It was all part of the couple's plan. Previously, Harold had killed a little girl and turned her into a skeleton, treating her as his daughter to fill his void. Apparently, David and Celia were the girl's parents. After investigating, they finally discovered the truth. Instead of reporting to the police, they sought revenge and staged this elaborate act, not reporting the missing person to prevent police intervention. Now, they intended to use their medical knowledge to keep Harold in a state of extreme pain without dying. If Harold was on the verge of death, they could save him, only to continue his suffering. The fourth story, titled The V Word, begins with a teenager named Justin trying to persuade his father who left his original family and lived with his new lover. But the father never thought he was wrong. When his friend Carrie found out, he told Justin not to worry too much about his father or he would look like a sentimental girl. This remark provoked Justin, who challenged Carrie to see who was more courageous. Late at night, Justin took Carrie to the funeral parlor where his cousin worked. The parlor was filled with corpses, and whoever could stay inside the longest and see the most dead bodies would be considered the bravest. They then knocked on the door pretending to be calm. Strangely, nobody answered. Justin was sure his cousin was on duty, so they decided to enter since the door was unlocked. As they searched the place, Justin called his cousin's name, but there was no response. Carrie suspected that their cousin was hiding to play a prank on them, as clues on the table indicated he had suddenly left his post. It seemed like their cousin still didn't want to come out, so they decided to check the corpses first. They went upstairs and planned to see some recently deceased friends, but in the end, both chickened out. When they returned, they were shocked to find that the previously closed coffin had opened by itself. It seemed like their cousin was playing a joke, but Justin thought something was off and insisted on leaving. 
However, the main door was now locked, and they had to find another way out. After searching, they realized there was no back door. Just as they panicked, music started playing from upstairs. They gathered their courage and went to the second floor. The music came from a room with a stereo, but there were no cassettes. In the center of the room, there was an old lady with half-done makeup who seemed to have already passed away. Justin quickly left the room, and they continued searching until they found the morgue. The sight of the corpses was enough to make them shudder, but they unexpectedly found fresh blood on the floor. They realized something must have happened to their cousin, and soon, his lifeless body appeared before them. His neck was bitten and torn, showing no signs of life. Suddenly, a nearby corpse woke up. It was the vampire villain, Cheney. Realizing Cheney was not a human in disguise, they immediately fled the room. Cheney began his attack, and Carrie was knocked down the stairs, breaking his leg. Although Justin desperately carried him downstairs, the locked door prevented their escape. While searching for a way out, Cheney bit Carrie's chick neck, killing him instantly. Justin tried to stop Cheney, but his attacks were like tickles to the strong vampire. Seeing no other option, Justin gave up. When he noticed an urn nearby, Justin smashed the window with the urn and managed to escape. Upon returning home, Justin immediately called the police about the vampire attack. However, the authorities didn't believe his story and even warned him that filing a false report was illegal. With no other choice, Justin called his father. His father had always looked down on him and after a brief conversation, hung up the phone, claiming he needed to rest. Justin then thought of his mother, but she was out visiting relatives with his sister. Feeling helpless, Justin tried to figure out what to do. Half an hour later, he was awoken from his sleep by a knock on the door. To his surprise, it was Carrie who was supposed to be dead. Carrie told him he had escaped the funeral parlor and his leg injury wasn't as bad as they thought, so he had managed to make it to Justin's house. Justin realized he needed to call an ambulance, but as he turned around, Carrie disappeared. It turned out Carrie wanted to drink water, but his neck wound was so severe that he couldn't swallow. He soon collapsed again. As Justin was about to call for help once more, Carrie suddenly stood up, apologized for being hungry, and bit Justin to death. Sometime later, Justin woke up in excruciating pain, discovering that his neck had been bitten off. His mother had returned home, and to avoid worrying her, Justin forced himself to get up. His mother didn't notice anything was wrong with him, even ignoring the bloodstains on the floor. He started cleaning the carpet at his mother's request. Ever since waking up, Justin had been experiencing strange urges, which led to him ignoring his sister's questions and unintentionally angering her. He looked at the food on the table, but had no appetite. Eventually, his mother noticed that something was off. His body was extremely cold. However, after taking his temperature, she dismissed it, thinking he had just partied too hard. After resting for a while, Justin suddenly felt an urge to attack his mother, but he managed to restrain himself. Then he eyed his sister, but again, he held back. Realizing he couldn't stay without harming his family, Justin decided to leave. Somehow, he ended up at his father's house. His father was fast asleep, and although Justin felt the urge to attack him too, he resisted, remembering that this man was his father. Carrie, who had been hiding in the shadows, could no longer bear it. He tried to persuade Justin to bite his father's neck, but Justin adamantly refused. Left with no other choice, Carrie killed Justin's father himself. Although Justin craved blood, he managed to overcome his desires. To prevent himself from making a mistake, he fled the scene as quickly as possible. However, Cheney was waiting for him outside and unhappy with his actions. At that moment, Justin suddenly recognized Cheney. It turned out that Cheney used to be their math teacher, but he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. During his life, Cheney would often kidnap young men and take them home, where he would sexually harass them. Later, Cheney died for unknown reasons and became a vampire. Carrie was the first person Cheney assimilated. Cheney wanted Justin to join the rank of the undead just like Carrie and help him find living people to feed on. After saying this, Cheney forcibly took Justin to his lair. Carrie, following Cheney's instructions, had already captured Prey, Justin's sister. Carrie retained his memories from when he was alive. However, after learning about the advantages of being a vampire, he willingly became Cheney's servant. To make Justin lose himself completely, Cheney extracted blood from his sister's body and injected it into Justin's wound. Justin then felt an unprecedented sense of satisfaction. However, he regained himself when he heard his sister's screams. He grabbed a syringe and blinded Cheney with it. Feeling guilty, Carrie decided to turn against Cheney when he saw this scene. The two of them worked together to chop off Cheney's head, a fatal blow for a vampire. After taking care of him, Justin remembered that his sister was captured by Carrie. 
Despite this, he couldn't bring himself to blame Carrie entirely, since it wasn't his idea to go to the funeral parlor in the first place. In the end, Carrie promised Justin that he would never set foot in the city again and would never harm Justin's family. Justin, on the other hand, chose self-destruction, fearing that one day he wouldn't be able to control himself and would kill and drink blood. The fifth story, titled Sounds Like, begins with a doer office gentleman named Larry, who had exceptionally sensitive hearing. Although this ability could help him at work, it drove him crazy in daily life. The noise of children playing and the metallic clinking of his wife knitting echoed in his head, and he had to endure it. Tomorrow is Larry's wedding anniversary with his wife, so she's excited and chatty, which is a disaster for Larry because of the many noises outside. Staying outside felt like being in hell. A few months ago, while playing outside with his son, Larry suddenly heard his son's heartbeat. Although he immediately took his son to the hospital, it was too late. The doctor found that his son's heart was dying, and if it had been discovered one or two years earlier, he might have been saved. The loss of his son shocked Larry, who previously had average hearing, but now his sense of hearing had become acute. Even the slightest rustle became unbearably loud to him. Although his wife chose a relatively quiet restaurant as per his request, it couldn't be completely silent, so Larry was very uncomfortable. However, he didn't want to ruin his wife's mood, so he endured it. His wife made up some lies, hinting that they should have another child since people can't always live in the shadows. Due to Larry's distraction at work, his boss finally reached his limit. Knowing that Larry's child had just passed away, he didn't scold him but ordered him to see a therapist instead. After leaving his boss's office, Larry suddenly noticed a co-worker comforting a client. The co-worker was responsible for troubleshooting difficult issues with the company's software, but after learning that the client had just lost her husband, he provided psychological counseling and helped the client overcome her grief. The co-worker was shocked that Larry could hear distant conversations. The psychologist recommended by the boss was indeed skilled. In their first meeting, Larry realized his own problems. He thought he had found a savior, but to treat Larry, the doctor had woven a few lies to make him feel like they were friends. Yet Larry saw through the lies because of the doctor's gestures. Out of options, Larry sought help from his co-worker, hoping he could help. At home, Larry could wear noise-proof headphones, but he couldn't do so at work. Everyone overlooked him, and only his son provided emotional support. With that support gone, Larry spiraled uncontrollably towards the abyss, treating the co-worker in front of him like his own son, and saying strange things as a result. At dinner, his wife informed Larry that she was pregnant. However, Larry was puzzled. They only had sex once a month, and the last time was just two days ago. How could she be sure she was pregnant? His wife explained that an angel in her dream told her. Like Larry, she too suffered from a psychological condition due to their son's departure. Larry panicked, wondering how long he could maintain his sanity. At that moment, a nest of newborn mice disturbed him, and he could no longer bear it. He grabbed a hammer and killed the mice. The next day, the boss told Larry that the co-worker he had spoken to the day before had resigned and complained about being harassed by him. The psychologist called to say the treatment wasn't going well, but Larry didn't care, as the sound of flies on the glass prevented him from concentrating. Under these conditions, Larry couldn't work normally. The sound of raindrops on his car made him abandon it and run away, so he had no choice but to go to the library. However, even the seemingly quiet library wasn't completely silent, as the sounds of flipping pages and biting pens bothered Larry. In the end, even the faint hum of electric lights enraged him. To quell his anger, Larry endured the noise and destroyed everything in his home that could make a sound, including dismantling the electricity meter. He thought everything would be fine, but he still heard noises from upstairs. It turned out to be his wife's eyelid twitching. At this point, Larry had lost all his sanity. To achieve absolute silence, he smothered his wife to death with a pillow. In the early morning, a neighbor knocked on Larry's door. After chatting with him for a while, Larry suddenly realized that his hearing had returned to a normal level. The noises outside no longer bothered him, and he could finally enjoy life. However, at night, Larry could still hear noises in the house. It turned out that the faucet was leaking. But even after blocking the leak, the sound persisted. It seemed that his hearing hadn't returned to normal after all. Sure enough, Larry's hearing became extremely sensitive again. Even if he blocked the door, the noises inside the house still bothered him. With no other choice, Larry had to sleep in the car with his ears plugged. When he woke up, Larry finally felt no more noise disturbance. However, the problem was that he couldn't hear anything at all. It turned out he simply forgot to remove his earplugs. Larry's mental state had deteriorated to the point that he couldn't work normally. After cutting off all customer service connections, he stormed out of the office. 
All the sounds he heard had become like the static noise of a radio without a signal. This was no longer just a simple amplification. Larry couldn't even receive normal sounds anymore. Soon, the sounds from underground attracted Larry's attention. It turned out to be earthworms crawling beneath the ground. Even such tiny noises bothered Larry. He simply didn't know what to do. A neighbor noticed something was wrong with Larry and called the police. After venting for a while, Larry suddenly heard noises coming from his son's room. After searching the room, he realized the sound was coming from outside. A tree branch was rubbing against the window. When the police arrived, they found Larry's wife's body covered in maggots. Following the blood stains on the ground, they quickly caught up with Larry, who had cut off his ears. Finally, Larry experienced the long-lost tranquility. The sixth story, titled Pro-Life, begins with a doctor, Alex, and a nurse chatting and flirting while they almost bumped into Angie, who was on the run for some unknown reason. To ensure Angie's safety, they rushed her to the hospital for a checkup. Soon after their arrival, a red car followed them to the hospital. Angie asked the hospital staff to stop the car and not let anyone inside. The person in the car was a religious fanatic named Dwayne. Although everyone was afraid of him, the hospital was not a place for him to wreak havoc. The security guard asked him to keep his distance. Angie then admitted her identity, acknowledging that Dwayne was her father. For Angie's sake, Dwayne agreed to keep his distance, but if the hospital didn't hand Angie over to him within 15 minutes, he would resort to violence. Although Alex was annoyed that Angie had deliberately hidden her identity, the checkup still had to be done. Angie's protruding belly indicated that she was pregnant. She knew her condition and asked the two to help her get rid of the child. Alex didn't dare to make decisions without the hospital's approval, so he consulted the director of the hospital. The director instructed them to finish the checkup first. Since Angie was only 15 years old, Alex asked about her experience. Angie said she got pregnant last Saturday, less than a week ago, but her belly was already this big. It was clear she was lying. Seeing that Alex didn't believe her, Angie didn't bother explaining and urged him to help with the operation. Alex speculated that Angie might have been raped, and the person who assaulted her was probably Dwayne. After all, when they met Angie earlier, she was escaping from someone, and now Dwayne had shown up. Alex believed he was right, so he was no longer afraid of Dwayne, as this is a serious crime, especially when the victim is one's daughter. Dwayne lost his patience and couldn't help but start arguing with Alex. Alex bluntly asked Dwayne if the child in her belly was his, which infuriated Dwayne. He seemed to care about the child in Angie's womb and demanded Alex to ensure the child's safety at all costs, or else he would face consequences. As Alex examined the fetus in Angie's belly, it reacted strongly, beyond Alex's understanding. After several failed attempts, Alex had to give up the examination. Meanwhile, Dwayne called over his sons, planning to forcefully take Angie away. Ever since Angie became pregnant, a voice had been echoing in Dwayne's mind, which he believed to be God speaking to him. Thus, he would follow whatever God said to protect the child in Angie's womb. Knowing that Dwayne had cut off the hospital's phone line beforehand, the security guard couldn't call the police. Seeing the guard refusing to back down, Dwayne shot him to meet Jesus. The sound of gunshots caught the attention of the patients and the director. Since they couldn't contact the outside world, they had to save themselves. Under the director's arrangement, the patients hid in the isolation ward, while the director opened the safe and took out the equipment inside. Although Dwayne's youngest son didn't want to kill anyone, he had no choice. Dwayne was determined to serve God. Angie was moved to the operating room and Alex asked her again about the reason for her pregnancy. The fetus in Angie's belly was so strange, and the instruments malfunctioned whenever they got close to it. Angie could no longer hide the truth and revealed it. One Saturday night, Angie was alone in her yard swinging on a swing, when suddenly a pair of demonic hands grabbed her feet and dragged her sexy body into the underworld. There, Angie was tormented by a demon and soon became pregnant with its demonic child. She ran away at first because Dwayne ordered her to give birth to the child. After Dwayne and his gang broke into the hospital, they quickly faced the director's counterattack. Due to the overwhelming firepower, the director soon switched from offense to defense. The demon fetus was developing rapidly and now it was impossible to get rid of it, otherwise her life would be in danger. Seeing Angie's determination to die with the demon fetus, the nurse had no choice but to knock her out. Dwayne was chatting with the director while arranging for his son to get closer. However, the director was smart and easily saw through his plan. With no other choice, Dwayne had to sacrifice his son's life. But the director was only wounded in the leg. 
In the isolation ward, a worried man thought that if Dwayne discovered him, he would be finished. He blamed his daughter for getting pregnant, causing him to end up in chaos. But the nurse hit him and scolded him for his lack of responsibility. The director, running out of bullets and relying on his bulletproof vest, continued to hold on but eventually lost to Dwayne. As the nurse was delivering the baby, she was sprayed in the face with amniotic fluid. However, it was scorching hot, causing the nurse to temporarily lose her sight. After subduing the director, Dwayne began a passionate speech about how killing the fetus was a desecration of life and that the director was a murderous maniac for all the fetuses that had died there. He vowed to make the hospital taste the same pain. Once the man confirmed Dwayne's location, he quickly took his family and escaped from the hospital, only to run into Dwayne's youngest son, who was on the lookout. The son didn't have much killing intent, so the man's wife and daughter managed to escape. Seeing the son let his guard down, the man pounced on him, only to be shot dead. At the same time, the demonic baby was successfully born. It had a human face and a spider-like body. Not long after, a bull-like demon emerged from the ground and dragged a staff member into the underworld. Dwayne arrived at the operating room, only to find that Angie had already given birth. He then prayed to God, begging him not to take his daughter away. His youngest son entered the hospital and encountered the demon who killed him instantly. Although Dwayne heard his son's screams, he didn't care at that moment. After all, he had helped God, and it was time to receive his reward. When he saw the demonic baby, Dwayne was shocked by the child's demonic look, which was quite different to his original thoughts. Thinking of this, Dwayne immediately confronted the demon. After the demon shouted to protect the child, the religious fanatic realized that he wasn't serving God, but the demon instead. Now Dwayne was no longer useful to the demon, but he had bought time for Angie. She picked up a gun next to her, struggled to get out of bed, and killed the demonic baby with one shot. By the time the demon arrived, it was too late. Surprisingly, the demon didn't hurt Angie, but left grieving, cradling the lifeless baby. The seventh story, titled Screwfly Solution, begins in the early morning when a neighbor happened to see a house owner cleaning up blood stains in his own yard. The neighbor immediately called the police, who found three female bodies in his house. The man was arrested and confessed to his crimes, but surprisingly, he did not feel guilty about killing. He even claimed that it was all God's will. In order to tackle the insect issues, humans have altered some male insects to lose their reproductive abilities. They are then released, disrupting the reproductive cycle and leading to a sharp decline in the species population. Alan works at the CDC, and he has just finished this mission with his father. However, his mother believes that every species has a reason to exist. Humans have mercilessly encroached on animals' territories, driving them to extinction under the guise of self-preservation. She believed that humans are pests in the eyes of insects, too, but her family won't agree with her. Recently, multiple homicides have occurred in a certain area. All the victims were female, and the perpetrators were male. Alan's mother was sent by the National Health Institute to investigate these cases. Upon arriving at the area, the military stopped her. It turned out that there had already been over 1,100 homicides, all involving female victims. For her safety, the military forbade her from entering the area. Despite their objections, the mother insisted that the murders might be related to a new virus, and she had to go into the city to investigate. The military reluctantly took her to the dungeon where the murderer was held. The killer was also a soldier, but for unknown reasons, he went berserk while watching a dance and killed the dancer. He believed that men lived in the pure paradise of Eden before women arrived, and women were the root of all evil. Although the mother explained that women are part of God's plan and that both genders must coexist for humanity to thrive, the murderer refused to listen and even attempted to kill her. After investigating, the mother discovered that the killers targeting women had never touched a Bible before. It seemed as though religious concepts suddenly sprang into their minds out of nowhere, which was clearly abnormal. Upon hearing the mother's description, the father realized how serious the situation was. The crime scenes formed a line, similar to the path of certain hurricanes. But how could beliefs be transmitted through the air? After consulting many sources, the mother couldn't find many helpful clues, only knowing that similar cases had occurred worldwide. Soon, the mother was killed by the commanding officer. It turned out that the military in the city had been infected, and they too could not tolerate women. Upon the mother's death, the FBI contacted Allen, as she had mentioned before that Allen possessed valuable information. Allen and his father analyzed the situation, determining that the murders were not related to religion, but were likely caused by some sort of disease. 
the mastermind behind the scenes aimed to destroy humanity. Before finding a cure, all women had to be quarantined to prevent them from being attacked. Then, large quantities of contraceptive hormones would be produced, forcing all the men in the city to take them to suppress their impulses or undergo irreversible treatments. The higher-ups could not think of a better solution, so they followed Allen's and his father's advice. As the virus spread, the streets became more dangerous for women. Men no longer cared about decency, and even running over a woman in the street was not a big deal. Alan's wife and daughter were terrified and called for Alan to come home as soon as possible. At his father's urging, Alan boarded a plane to return home. However, a murder took place during the flight. It turned out that there were multiple virus-infected individuals on the plane. Worried about being infected, Alan contacted his wife, Anne, upon landing, instructing her to take their daughter and head north. There, the number of murders was the lowest, and it would be best if they could get a gun for self-defense. Alan suspected he might be infected, so he planned to visit a lab for a checkup first. Anne and her daughter started practicing their shooting skills. On their way north, they unexpectedly found someone in the father's cabin. It was Alan. The daughter, unaware of the truth, didn't suspect anything. However, Anne knew that Alan had been infected. Although Alan claimed to have found a cure, his behavior was unlike his usual self, and he even tried to take advantage of their daughter. Realizing he couldn't hide his intentions, Alan attacked Anne. She had brought a gun, but she couldn't bring herself to kill Alan, so she shot him in the leg instead. The daughter blamed her mother for acting irrationally, as Alan hadn't done anything wrong, and even said he'd found a cure. Anne had to explain that there was no cure, and Alan was no longer the man he used to be. The daughter refused to believe it. Seeing that her daughter was asleep, Anne stepped out of the car to find a place to relieve herself. Unbeknownst to her, the daughter was only pretending to sleep and seized the opportunity to drive the car away. After much difficulty, Anne returned to the cabin, only to find her daughter's lifeless body. Unable to bear such a heavy blow, Anne fainted. Fortunately, the person who found her was her father-in-law, who had been infected. However, he had taken hormones in advance, allowing him to maintain his sanity. The other infected men were unaware of his consciousness and did not guard against him. They even allowed him to escort Anne, disguised as a man. But the hormones would eventually run out, and there were restrictions on obtaining them in the city. Each person could only buy a small amount. The father knew he would not last long, and his only wish was for Anne to expose the mastermind behind everything. After burying her father-in-law, Anne planned to buy some bullets. However, the shopkeeper and customers saw through her disguise. They followed her closely, and she couldn't shake them off. To escape their pursuit, Anne had no choice but to drive into the woods. However, the shopkeeper easily saw through her tactic. With no other option, Anne fled in her car. The shopkeeper and his companions brought hunting dogs, making it impossible for her to escape their grasp. At a critical moment, a flash of white light attracted the attention of the three men and the hunting dogs. It turned out there were aliens in the forest, and they were the masterminds behind the series of murders. The shopkeeper and his companions were unaware of this and tried to kill the aliens, but they were killed instead. In the eyes of the aliens, humans were like pests, but their numbers were vast. They couldn't be exterminated by killing alone, so the aliens modified a portion of the male population, infecting them with a virus that caused hatred towards women. The virus was easily contagious, and some of the infected, who were kept in the dark, even believed it was a divine command. Before he died, the father-in-law told Anne that as long as she was alive, there's a chance for victory. However, Anne could only hide in the least populated places, waiting for the doom of humanity. The eighth story, titled Valerie on the Stairs, begins with a failed writer named Rob. Although he had completed four novels since his debut, none were published. Recently, he had broken up with his girlfriend and was short on money. He accepted an invitation to a building owned by the owner, who had invited many failed writers like Rob to stay there for free, providing them with food and shelter until their novels were published and their livelihoods secured. After a brief introduction, Rob followed the landlord's guidance and arrived at the newly vacant room. He put down his belongings, and suddenly, a knocking sound came from outside the door. When he opened it, there was nothing there. The same thing happened again shortly after. In addition to that, there were also noises of something hitting the walls. It seemed as if the sound was coming from inside the walls. Later that evening, while writing, the knocking sound returned, and a woman appeared in the mirror. To investigate, Rob left the room. The sound seemed to be coming from upstairs. He took a quick look around the upper floor, but found nothing. Late at night, a sudden bout of crying woke up Rob from his pig-like sleep. 
Following the sound, he discovered the woman who had previously appeared in the mirror. She kept crying out for help, but was unwilling to reveal her ordeal. Soon, she vanished into the darkness. Rob immediately chased after her, only to find a wall blocking his way. His pounding on the wall woke up the other tenants. Faced with their inquiries, Rob was at a loss for an explanation. The female writer named Anna was very displeased with Rob for disturbing her intimate time. A male writer named Bruce didn't blame him and even offered to help. Rob had previously asked Bruce if the place was haunted, but Bruce denied it, saying if it were, it must be a prank by other unsuccessful writers. While Bruce was looking for writing inspiration, the bathroom suddenly reverted to its appearance from a few days ago. The crying sound echoed again, and following it, Rob encountered the woman who had previously cried for help. She was still sobbing and pleading for Rob to save her. As he approached, a demonic hand forcefully snatched her away. Determined to get to the bottom of this, Rob sought out Bruce. He wanted to know what could be inside the walls. Bruce wasn't sure, suggesting it might be pipes, and that strange noises wouldn't be surprising considering the odd characters living there. That night, Rob had a nightmare in which the woman was captured by a demon. Waking up, he found the dream's content had appeared in his novel. Suddenly, his computer began to restart automatically. Once it was done, the dream's content disappeared, revealing it was a dream within a dream. The next day, Rob received another message from the woman whose name was Valerie. She had been imprisoned by the demon for a long time. She had fallen in love with Rob and only he could save her. But Rob was no match for the demon, so she could only sneak out to see him briefly. Soon, the demon discovered the two of them, and Valerie had no choice but to return to its side. Rob's wall pounding caught the attention of the other tenants again. The landlord had to warn him that if he continued to make noise, he would have to move out. Rob apologized and asked everyone what was behind the wall. The landlord told him it might be electrical wires, pipes, or even a dead rat. Unable to find any clues, Rob confided his experiences to Bruce, who was also unable to provide any useful information. Upon learning that Bruce was writing, Rob took advantage to sneak a peek at his novel. The content shocked Rob. Valerie was a character in the novel. When Bruce discovered his manuscript had been read without permission, he scolded Rob. Rob then realized that the so-called strange events were actually caused by the group of writers. Valerie might have been a tenant here before her death, and these writers had killed her, which was why they wouldn't tell the truth. Convinced he had guessed correctly, Rob incorporated his experiences into his novel. Valerie suddenly appeared in Bruce's room. He could hardly believe that Valerie had become a physical entity. However, Valerie was pursued by the demon to the room, and Bruce was killed by the demon in an instant. It turns out, both the demon and Valerie were characters from the novel, their fates controlled by the authors. But the demon was later influenced by the resentment of a group of writers and entered the real world. Unwilling to have its fate controlled by the authors, the demon decided to kill them and seize control of its destiny. The old writer, Everett, advised Rob to leave while he still could. After all, not many people read novels these days. Rob noticed a poster in Everett's room, which depicted a demon identical to the one he'd seen in his dreams. As it turned out, Everett had written a terrible horror novel in his youth that was later adapted into a film. The film didn't perform well, but Everett cherished its poster. Rob asked Everett about Valerie's whereabouts, but Everett ignored him and pushed him away. Soon, the landlord discovered Bruce's body. The demon's footprints extended into the wall, indicating a hidden passage. The landlord didn't know how to explain it. Having acquired Bruce's manuscript, Rob finally understood everything. The novel Valerie on the Stairs was co-authored by three writers, Bruce, Anna, and Everett. Now that the demon had become a physical entity, it wanted to change its fate, making Anna and Everett its next targets. Rob couldn't be with Valerie because the novel stated that she belonged to the demon. Quickly, Valerie found Anna. After sighing, Anna embraced Valerie, apologizing for writing her character so tragically that she had been tormented by the demon for a long time. Anna soon met her demise at the hands of the demon. By the time Rob and Everett arrived, it was too late. Everett revealed the location of the demon's lair. Behind the wall was a passage that led to hell. When the three authors had collaborated on the novel years ago, they had become addicted to writing about the demon's gruesome acts. They channeled their dissatisfaction with life into their writing, filling the novel with darkness, and never brought the story to an end. Valerie was the only survivor among the countless victims, as the authors couldn't bear to write the death of their protagonist. Realizing his mistake, Everett decided to put an end to it all by his own hand. The road to hell is littered with corpses. 
As Rob took a closer look, he was shocked to find that one of the bodies was his ex-girlfriend. After she woke up, she bit Everett's neck, ending his dying life. Now, Rob had to face the demon alone. Bullets had no effect on the demon, so even when Rob shot at it, he couldn't hurt it. Rob was no match for the demon, so Valerie had to keep pleasing it. Unable to take it anymore, Rob shot off the demon's ear. Valerie wanted to seize the opportunity to escape, but she was shackled with chains. Unexpectedly, Rob managed to unchain Valerie and took her as a hostage, causing the demon to hesitate to attack. While the demon was wailing in pain, Rob pushed it into a pit of fire, killing it instantly. Finally, Valerie was free. However, she refused to leave the building because the novel never mentioned her successful escape. In the end, Valerie vanished into thin air. The police arrived at the scene after receiving a report, and it seemed like everything was over. Just then, Rob discovered that his body was covered in the novel's content. It turns out, Rob was also a character from the novel, created by Bruce. Even his final failure was part of the original novel, and Rob didn't change anything. The ninth story, titled Right to Die, begins with a man named Cliff, who had just done something unforgivable to his wife, so he kept apologizing to her. It wasn't until he recited their wedding vows that her attitude softened. However, Cliff accidentally crashed his car into a tree on the road because he wasn't paying attention, causing an accident. While trying to save themselves, Cliff called for help, but unexpectedly, the car caught fire. The fierce flames quickly engulfed his wife, who was covered in gasoline. Cliff was powerless to help. The couple was later taken to the hospital, where the doctor told Cliff that his wife had suffered extensive burns all over her body. Her condition was very serious, and if they couldn't find suitable skin for a transplant, she could only live for a few more days. Even if the surgery was successful, she would be paralyzed for the rest of her life, only able to communicate by typing and moving her eyeballs. If they wanted to terminate treatment, they would need to file an application. After some consideration, Cliff sought the help of a lawyer friend. The lawyer knew Cliff's wife and understood her pursuit of perfection, so he agreed to help Cliff apply for euthanasia. He told Cliff not to feel burdened by it, as the betrayal was nothing in his eyes. A week before the accident, Cliff's wife had stumbled upon a video of Cliff and his secretary on his phone. Cliff had to admit that he had broken up with the secretary and would never fool around again. However, an accident occurred during their road trip. When Cliff woke up from his memories, he suddenly felt someone was nearby. To his surprise, his wife appeared unharmed in the bathtub. After a brief greeting, Cliff and his wife took a romantic bath together. But after just one minute, his wife's appearance changed, turning into her burned self. She quickly vanished, and Cliff thought it was just a dream, but the burns on his body were real. The lawyer advised him not to take the dream seriously, as his wife had always been in the hospital. After the phone call, Cliff's mother-in-law suddenly arrived, questioning why he wanted to terminate the emergency treatment. Cliff explained that it was his wife's wish, but his mother-in-law didn't believe him and accused him of trying to defraud the insurance. The next day, she brought many reporters and accused Cliff in front of them. After this incident, Cliff's reputation was ruined and his work became chaotic. The secretary also came, asking why Cliff hadn't been in touch recently. Cliff's wife had fired her before, leaving her unable to pay the rent. After hearing this, Cliff let the secretary return to her job, but their relationship had come to an end. After some investigation, the lawyer discovered the reason behind the mother-in-law's change of attitude. It turned out that during the accident, the airbag on the driver's side deployed normally, saving Cliff's life. However, the airbag on the wife's side did not deploy. The car company, wanting to suppress the news, decided to offer a million dollars in hush money to the legal guardian. To claim this million dollars, the mother-in-law decided to defame Cliff and strip him of his legal guardianship so that the money would belong entirely to her. The lawyer brought in some PR experts to help Cliff establish a positive image so that he wouldn't be too passive in future lawsuits. After learning about this, the secretary tried to seduce Cliff relentlessly. In the end, the judge ruled that the hospital could terminate treatment after 48 hours, meaning Cliff won the lawsuit against his mother-in-law. To celebrate, the lawyer went to the hospital room to boast to Cliff's wife, saying that, thanks to her, he could now afford a boat. Cliff hurried to the hospital to maintain his image. He intended to kiss his wife goodbye, but she bit his lip, breaking the skin. Immediately after, her heartbeat stopped. Since the application time hadn't been reached, the hospital staff continued their attempts to resuscitate her. During the rescue, the wife's intact figure flashed by, then disappeared. The lawyer wanted to make a call, but medical staff reminded him that cell phones were prohibited in the hospital. 
To get away from the staff, the lawyer mistakenly entered an empty room where metal objects were not allowed. Soon, his phone became scorching hot under the control of the wife's vengeful spirit. The machines in the room started operating, and the lawyer was quickly pinned to the door by a powerful magnetic force. The wife then materialized and used a fire spell to end the lawyer's life. Although Cliff heard the lawyer's screams, it was too late. After this incident, Cliff seemed to understand something. He constantly urged the doctors to do everything they could to save his wife, but they told him there was no matching skin available for a transplant. Cliff then rushed outside, saying that he couldn't let his wife die like this, no matter what she would look like. Cliff was afraid that his wife's ghost would come for him again, so he was on edge when returning home. To his surprise, the secretary was already waiting for him. Although Cliff initially didn't want to deal with her, he eventually gave in to her continuous seduction. After indulging himself, the secretary went to the living room to drink and sent photos to Cliff, without noticing what was happening behind her. Cliff rushed to the living room upon hearing a scream. The secretary was unharmed, but his wife was nowhere to be found. It turned out that his wife would turn into a vengeful ghost whenever her vital signs disappeared, which had happened several times before when she was resuscitated by doctors. After some thought, Cliff decided to kill his secretary. His wife had to stay alive. That night, his wife told Cliff that she was pregnant with his child and planned to quit smoking. However, she would not forgive him because Cliff didn't call an ambulance right away after the incident. Instead, he ignited the gasoline on the ground. It turned out that he had burned his wife severely. After undergoing surgery, Cliff cut off the skin from his secretary's body, intending to use it to save his wife. But the doctor informed him that his wife had died the night before. The secretary's death was in vain. When he returned home, Cliff indeed saw his wife's ghost, but this time, no one could save him. The tenth story, titled We All Scream for Ice Cream, begins with Lane and his friends still feeling cold in the hot weather. After attending the funeral of a childhood friend, Lane immediately returned home. His wife didn't feel the cold, so perhaps Lane was weak. Ever since Lane moved back to his hometown, his childhood friends began to die mysteriously one after another, and the police couldn't even find their bodies. Lane's childhood friend Toot suspected that it might have something to do with Lane. Although Lane knew that Toot doubted him, there was nothing he could do since he couldn't prove his innocence. The man Joe originally planned to have a reunion with his childhood friends, but on his way home, he heard a creepy nursery rhyme that he had heard in his childhood. The local ice cream clown would play this jingle while selling ice cream. Two children by the roadside seemed dazed, as if they were waiting for something. They were probably waiting for ice cream, just like Lane when he was a kid. Waking up from his memories, Lane suddenly realized that the car window was visibly freezing over. Due to the obstructed view, he almost hit his son. It was already late, but his son was also waiting for ice cream. The eerie nursery rhyme played again, sending chills down Lane's spine. Frightened, he immediately took his son back inside the house. His son wasn't sick, and his wife remembered that he had gone to bed earlier. Worried that his daughter might experience the same problem, Lane asked his wife to contact their daughter. On the other side, a child got a mysterious clown's ice cream. As soon as he ate it, Toot's body began to dissolve and quickly turned into a puddle of mud. The local thug, Virgil, happened to witness this scene. Lane's daughter was safe, so he finally felt relieved. His wife could tell that Lane was preoccupied and urged him to share his thoughts. Lane then told her a story from 20 years ago. Back then, Lane and his friends formed a gang for fun. At that time, a popular ice cream was being sold in the town, loved by all the kids. The clown who sold this ice cream was named Buster. Although he had some intellectual challenges, he got along great with the children. But Virgil didn't like him. In his eyes, the children who bought the ice cream were foolish. One day, Virgil couldn't take it anymore. He slandered Buster, claiming his ice cream was filthy. To mock him, Virgil even took off Buster's fake nose. As it turned out, Buster was disabled and had no nose. Virgil was so frightened that he wet his pants, becoming the laughingstock of the town. Since then, Virgil became even more aggressive, gradually becoming the town's notorious thug. Lane stopped his story there. Later, Joe called Lane out. When Lane arrived at the designated location, he saw a puddle of pus. A friend had been with Toot before and saw Virgil at the scene when Toot died. Joe therefore guessed that Virgil was the murderer of their playmates. Since there was no corpse at the scene, Joe couldn't rashly call the police. Late at night, Lane's son started singing the ice cream jingle in a bizarre manner and headed outside to buy ice cream. Luckily, Lane stopped him in time. His daughter also wanted to go out to buy ice cream, but Lane managed to stop her. At that moment, the clown's truck suddenly appeared in the fog. After Lane yelled at him, the truck quickly left. 
With his wife's reminder, Lane noticed the wrapper on the ground and thought that the murderer might not be Virgil. Time flashes back to the past when Virgil forced Lane and his gang to prank Buster together because noseless Buster seemed like a monster to them. They each had their roles, attracting Buster's attention, sneaking up from behind, and turning off the brakes. They never intended to escalate the situation, but the truck's impact was more powerful than they had imagined. In the end, Buster was crushed to death by his own truck. Perhaps it was Buster's ghost that killed their playmates. Buster loved children, so Lane believed that the town's kids were in danger. But first, they needed to find Virgil, who might know some crucial information. As Lane suspected, Virgil did know that the murderer was Buster's ghost. The ice cream had been eaten by Toot's son, and not long after, Toot's body dissolved into a puddle of mud. It seemed that once the target ate the ice cream, the target's father would die. Years ago, the members of the gang had killed Buster, and now he had returned to the living world. He wanted to wipe out the gang through their children. Virgil knew the truth but wasn't worried because he had no children, or so he thought. He spent his time gloating as the others suffered. Just as he was feeling smug, he suddenly lost control of his body. Soon, his body began to dissolve. In less than a minute, Virgil turned into a puddle of mud. It turned out that Virgil did have a child. He had numerous affairs, and someone had given birth to his child without his knowledge. In order not to involve his family, Lane asked his wife to move back to her mother's house. Meanwhile, Joe finally believed Lane's account. So he locked up the children as Lane suggested, even using duct tape to restrain them if necessary. After saying goodbye to his family, Lane set up traps in the yard, prepared for Buster's arrival. Meanwhile, his wife was intercepted by Buster on her way. As soon as the ad jingle started, their son and daughter immediately threw themselves into Buster's arms. Unable to open the door, their mother could only watch helplessly. Lane made an ice cream using the wrapper he had found earlier. During Joe's journey home, he suddenly dissolved into pus because his son had already eaten the ice cream given by Buster. Wherever Buster went, the temperature would drop. So as soon as he arrived, Lane noticed him. Lane was the kindest member of the gang, and Buster's hatred for him was the least intense. Therefore, Buster had deliberately spared him a few times. However, revenge still had to be taken. After barely controlling the children, Lane activated the traps. Buster was quickly frozen into an ice block after being drenched. Lane knew he was at fault, so he tried to apologize on behalf of his friends to Buster. After apologizing, Lane decided to end it all himself. However, he didn't expect Buster to be immune to freezing. Not only that, but Buster also used the ice on his body to strengthen himself. Lane was helpless. The ice cream time was about to begin. Although the freezing effect only lasted a few seconds each time, his son managed to break free from Buster's enchantment. Soon, the son discovered the ice cream Lane had made. The character represented by the ice cream was none other than Buster. The son ate the ice cream, and in the end, Buster was defeated by his own rapper. It seemed as if the story was over, but to their surprise, Lane heard Buster's song again at the end of the film. The eleventh story, titled The Black Cat, begins with a struggling writer, Edgar, living in poverty. His wife is seriously ill, but he can't afford to get her the medical treatment she needs. He keeps putting it off, and one day his wife coughs up blood. Edgar realizes that he must find a way to make money quickly. Unfortunately, the editor-in-chief doesn't appreciate Edgar's work. His stories are only published in the gossip section, and his pay is pitifully low. Edgar wants to confront the editor, but if he does, he and his wife will be finished. So he can only think about it and rely on the editor's financial support for their daily lives. Edgar wants to write a new piece, but he has no inspiration. Under immense pressure, he turns to drinking. The problem is, he already owes the tavern several months' worth of unpaid bills. This time, the owner refuses to let him run a tab. His friends, who he has previously forced to buy his stories, are no longer willing to help him. To make ends meet, Edgar's wife decides to sell her piano and give up her dream of pursuing music. This breaks Edgar's heart, but he's powerless to stop it. She plays the piano for the last time, but she coughs up blood once more. Her illness has worsened. The doctor tells Edgar that his wife has contracted a lung disease. The only way to alleviate her condition is to move her to a warmer climate, but this won't be a complete cure. The doctor has already helped Edgar free of charge several times before, but he can't keep providing services without payment. Reluctantly, the doctor refuses to help any further. In a fit of rage, Edgar smashes the piano to pieces as a way to vent his frustration. However, not long after, the piano miraculously restores itself to its original state. Ignoring her illness, Edgar's wife gets out of bed to clean the piano. If they don't sell it, they may not make it through the month. 
She doesn't want to burden Edgar any further. She can't bear to see him ruined by alcohol. Understanding this, Edgar starts writing again, but he still has no inspiration. At that moment, their pet cat starts causing trouble, and his wife begins coughing violently. The distractions prevent Edgar from concentrating on his writing, and he breaks his pen. While sharpening the pen, he injures himself. Soon after, Edgar discovers that the black cat has eaten their pet goldfish, causing him to be at a loss. When Edgar opens the door, he finds his wife's condition has become critical. Helpless, he can only stay by her side. After nightfall, Edgar was awakened by a loud noise. It turned out that the birdcage had fallen to the floor. Annoyed, Edgar started drinking again. After finishing his drink, he sent the pet bird to death, which was barely alive. At that moment, a cat's meow came from the room. The black cat had climbed onto his wife's bed. Edgar tried to shoo it away, but ended up getting scratched. He grabbed a nearby knife, using it to gouge out one of the cat's eyes. Afterward, his wife appeared again. Confused, Edgar didn't know how to explain the situation, as his wife was supposed to be severely ill. She was disappointed, seeing that Edgar had been drinking again. He tried to argue that the cat had spilled the wine, but his wife collapsed from her illness once more. This time, she never woke up again and left Edgar forever. The people around them felt sorry for Edgar's wife, as he was such a terrible person. The editor-in-chief decided to help organize a grand funeral for her. After all, life had to go on. He hoped Edgar could pull himself together, but this only angered Edgar. He had grown tired of writing, and his reputation meant nothing at that moment. Subsequently, Edgar drove away everyone who had come to attend the funeral. He wanted to be alone, as life had lost its meaning without his wife. However, the black cat jumped out and caused more trouble. Edgar then set the house on fire, intending to join his wife in death. Yet somehow his wife inexplicably woke up. Thankfully, their escape route wasn't blocked, and Edgar successfully got his wife out of the house. From then on, Edgar frequently experienced auditory hallucinations, always feeling like he was being followed by a cat's tail. This made him feel very insecure. Edgar was afraid his wife would leave him, so he swore to her he would ever drink again. As it happened, thunder roared at that moment. His wife heard the cat's meow and opened the window to let the black cat in, which caused Edgar to break out in a cold sweat. It seemed like the black cat had not died in the fire, but fortunately, this wasn't the same cat as before. Edgar finally felt relieved. His wife had no friends, so she needed the black cat's company. However, there was something off about this cat, so Edgar suspected it was the cause of his wife's illness. After taking a sip of wine, Edgar saw the black cat again. He tried to kill it, but the cat was too fast. His wife hoped Edgar would stop his wild thoughts, but he had become irritable and wouldn't listen to her advice. He hated that he couldn't give his wife the life she wanted or cure her illness. He felt like a complete failure. His wife managed to calm him down, but then the black cat meowed again. Edgar thought the cat was taunting him, so he swung at it with all his might. His wife tried to protect the cat and wake Edgar up, but he couldn't stop in time, and the blow struck her head instead. This time, she died for good, and her death was quite gruesome. Although the thunder was loud, many neighbors still heard Edgar's screams. After some thought, Edgar decided to break open a wall and entomb his wife within it, pretending she had never come back to life. Later, Edgar continued to rely on alcohol for inspiration every day, completely forgetting his promise to his wife. One day, the police knocked on Edgar's door. They had received a complaint from a neighbor and were there to investigate. But they found no signs of a fight and were about to leave. However, Edgar insisted that the police check the basement. He was overly confident in his ability to hide a body. Perhaps after this search, the police would never return. After inspecting the basement, the police indeed found nothing suspicious. Just as they were about to leave, Edgar smugly tapped the wall, only for a scream to suddenly come from within. The police had no choice but to break down the wall. To their surprise, the scream turned out to be from the black cat, not Edgar's wife. Edgar, mentally collapsing, fled the basement and hid in the bedroom to avoid the police. There, he heard his wife coughing, who was alive and unharmed. And the black cat from before was still there, as if nothing had ever happened. It turned out that everything Edgar experienced was just a dream. After waking from this nightmare, Edgar had an epiphany and knew how to write his next piece. Thus, the famous short story, The Black Cat, was born. The twelfth story, titled The Washingtonians, begins with Mike rushing back to his hometown with his wife and daughter upon receiving news of his grandmother's critical illness. When they arrived, they found out that his grandmother had already passed away. As a result, they had to change their plans, staying in town for a few days until the funeral was over. 
Mike's daughter had always found the old mansion where her grandmother lived to be dark and eerie, so she was on edge ever since they returned, feeling as if something bad would happen. Eventually, she discovered a pair of eyes watching her from the basement, which prompted her to call for Mike. When Mike turned on the light, he realized it was just a portrait of George Washington. He had been frightened by it in his youth, so he understood his daughter's feelings. To overcome her fear, she kept shouting at the portrait that she was not afraid. But in the end, her fear got the better of her, and she kicked the portrait down. After comforting his daughter, Mike noticed a letter and a fork hidden in the portrait. The letter contained just a few short sentences, saying that he would flay the children, eat them, and use their bones as tools. Initially, the two thought it was a prank. However, the fork was indeed made of animal bones, and it could very well be human. Could it be that George Washington had a taste for eating children? That would be too absurd. The next day, Mike and his family visited his grandmother's grave to lay flowers. The local residents greeted them, but the daughter still felt uneasy. The villagers' smiles sent chills down her spine, like those of a predator eyeing a delicious meal. After the funeral, Samuel, who had once hosted Mike's family, told Mike that his grandfather was a collector. There were things in his collection that Mike might have never seen before, and his grandfather was not a simple man. On hearing this, Mike showed Samuel the letter, hoping he could explain its meaning. It turned out that this place was Washington's birthplace. Judging by the handwriting, it might have been written by Washington himself. When Mike took the letter back, Samuel offered to help Mike sell it for a good price. However, Mike believed that such a treasure belonged in a museum. Samuel stated that the letter could tarnish the nation's reputation and its contents must not be revealed to the public. On their way home, Mike encountered a mysterious stranger. Although the stranger was riding a Ferrari horse, Mike managed to avoid being caught. Upon returning home, Mike told his wife about the incident. He suspected that something was wrong with Washington's story. The villagers ate their food in a wild manner like savages, and they seemed to have their sights set on Mike's daughter. After dinner, the family returned home only to find that someone had ransacked it. The intruder showed no respect for Mike's family, not even bothering to clean up the mess. Mike knew they were looking for the letter. Moreover, the intruder had left a human heart in Mike's house. Although Mike didn't trust the locals, he had no choice but to call the police. The police speculated that the perpetrator might have wanted to exchange something for the heart or was simply issuing a warning. Before leaving, the officer advised Mike to let the matter go for now. Since the police couldn't be relied upon, Mike decided to return to the city overnight. Late at night, a man knocked on the daughter's window. Curiosity got the better of her, and she approached to take a closer look. The mysterious visitor bore an uncanny resemblance to George Washington. When Mike heard his daughter's scream, he rushed to her side, but the man had already left. Then there was a knock at the door. The person demanded that Mike hand over the letter, threatening to resort to violence if he refused. Mike's wife called the police as instructed, and the group fled upon hearing the sirens. Mike didn't trust the police, so he never told them about the letter. In order to investigate the truth, Mike contacted a friend who was well-versed in history. The friend deduced that the people who had come knocking the previous night were members of a group called the Washingtonians. They must have been after something important, as they wouldn't expose themselves so easily. At Mike's invitation, his friend arrived at his house. The Washingtonians were a mysterious group with influence spread across the country. Their members were cannibals, just like George Washington. They had committed terrible acts beyond just eating human flesh. This revelation shook Mike's beliefs. Realizing that Mike had a 10-year-old daughter, his friend became worried, as she could likely become a target for the Washingtonians. Suddenly, there was a frantic knocking at the door. It seemed that the Washingtonians had returned. With his wife and daughter upstairs, Mike had no choice but to send his friend away first. They were quickly surrounded by the cannibalistic group, and Mike's family was taken captive. After some time, they were transported to the Washingtonians' main base, where they were to be eaten. However, before that, the captors showed Mike something they had found in his house, a fork which completed their collection of human bones. It's revealed that during a time of war and food scarcity, Washington had accidentally discovered the taste of human flesh in a battle. From then on, cannibalism became a tradition in the Washington family. With absolute power, they could consume humans without any restrictions. Mike shouted that people like them were undeserving of being called heroes, which angered the group. It was time to act against Mike and his family, but they decided to first find the location of the letter. Just then, government forces arrived and sensed something was wrong. The Washingtonians fought back, but were quickly eradicated due to the superior firepower. 
From that day on, the Washington family ceased to exist. Six months later, a new government took control of the United States and the U.S. dollar was revamped. The 13th story, titled Dream Cruise, begins with Sean falling into the water while trying to retrieve a hat that had been dropped. Jack, not being a strong swimmer and overcome with fear, could only watch helplessly as Sean sank beneath the surface. From then on, Jack was haunted by a fear of water and frequently experienced hallucinations. Saito was facing a lawsuit due to a breach of contract. The boss knew that Saito was Jack's good friend, so he hoped Jack would persuade Saito. Upon learning this, Saito immediately arranged a meeting with Jack. When Jack arrived at the agreed-upon location, he met Saito's wife, Yuri. Yuri and Jack had an affair, so they started whispering to each other as soon as they met. However, Saito had already known about their relationship for a while, but had been tolerating it. Saito didn't want to discuss the matter in a restaurant, but preferred to talk it over at sea. Although Jack was afraid of water, he had no choice but to board Saito's yacht for the sake of his job. The yacht was called the Yuri, a gift Saito had bought to please Yuri. During their work discussion, Saito warned Jack that he could be trusted, but he should never betray him. At dinner, Saito started to hint at Jack, suggesting that Jack easily attracted women in Japan. Although it was his private business, Jack should never seduce a married woman. Under Saito's persistent questioning, Jack reluctantly admitted that Saito was right. The two guessed that Saito might already know about their illicit relationship. Yuri was very worried and afraid that Saito would take revenge. Not long after, Yuri suddenly noticed that they were not on the right route. Saito claimed to have his own plans, wanting to take them to a more enjoyable place. But at that moment, the propeller suddenly stopped spinning. No matter how Saito tried to start the yacht, there was no response. It seemed that the propeller had been entangled in seaweed. Saito commanded Jack to dive and clear the seaweed. After Yuri's persuasion, Saito could only sarcastically ask Jack how he had managed to seduce his wife. Then Saito donned diving gear and went underwater. It turned out that the propeller was not entangled in seaweed, but a large bundle of a woman's long hair. As Saito cleared the hair, the yacht was suddenly controlled by a mysterious force, which started the engine on its own. With a loud bang, Saito was caught in the chaos. Jack tried to save him, but Yuri told him to let go, saying that if Saito died, they would be rightfully together. In the end, Saito was not rescued. Jack was about to dive in to save him, but was stopped by Yuri, who suggested treating it as an accident. As the two argued, Saito suddenly climbed back onto the yacht. He had not been in any danger, but now he seemed different, not scolding the two, but reminding them not to worry. Yuri intended to seek help, but there was no signal in the area. After switching through several frequencies, Jack heard Sean's voice, which frightened him, and he asked Yuri to turn it off. Faced with Yuri's inquiry, Jack had no choice but to tell her about his childhood trauma. Just then, Saito approached Jack and Yuri, dragging an iron anchor. He said that his death was thanks to Yuri. As he spoke, Saito's voice changed into a woman's voice. He then picked up the anchor and attacked Yuri. Jack tried to stop it, but was knocked to the ground. By the time he got up, both Saito and Yuri were gone. Following the sound of Saito's voice, Jack found him, but Saito attacked him with the iron anchor. Jack was no match and got injured. Finally, Jack managed to stab Saito, who then pulled out the knife but lost an arm and a large chunk of flesh from his face. In the end, Saito uncontrollably fell into the water, revealing that he had been possessed by a female ghost. When Yuri woke up, she found herself locked in the bathroom. Jack heard her cries for help and tried to rescue her, but Saito's hand held him back tightly. Meanwhile, water gushed out in the bathroom, and Yuri would soon drown. Jack broke free from Saito's grip. However, the bathroom door was difficult to open, and there were no tools to force it. As the water engulfed her, Yuri saw a series of images. Saito had abandoned his wife and child for Yuri, claiming he had never loved his wife, Naomi. When Naomi refused to get a divorce, Saito beat her. Yuri experienced the same attack as she watched. Naomi cursed Saito and Yuri, wishing them a terrible death. Saito killed Naomi and threw her into the sea, causing her to become a ghost. After breaking down the door, Jack found Yuri unconscious but managed to revive her. It turned out that the area was where Saito had dumped Naomi's body. All the life jackets had been destroyed, and Naomi's ghost was lurking. Before long, Yuri transformed into Naomi. As Jack prepared to fight, Sean's ghost suddenly held him back, snapping him out of it. It turned out that everything he had seen was an illusion. When Naomi realized her illusion failed, she decided to take matters into her own hands. 
Jack reluctantly locked the door, but Naomi targeted the skylight, forcing them to find another escape. Yuri knew that Naomi was after her, so she decided to sacrifice herself in hopes that the ghost would spare Jack. However, Jack wouldn't allow it. The two decided to escape from the bottom. Soon, Naomi caught up with them, leaving a green light in her wake. There was only one life buoy left. Jack hesitated to jump, but leaped in with Yuri's encouragement. Unexpectedly, Naomi attacked from underwater, grabbing Yuri and trying to pull her down. Jack, who regretted not saving Sean in his childhood, refused to let go of Yuri this time. Just as Jack was about to lose his grip, Sean's ghost appeared and dragged Naomi into the depths of the sea, sacrificing himself to save Jack. It turned out that Sean had never blamed Jack, and Jack would always be his good friend. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.